Greeting from Tokyo. I am Mayumi Komoto, attorney at the Litigation Bureau of the Ministry of Justice of Japan. I'll be acting as program moderator today, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to session two of the 2022 Tokyo Forum on Dispute Resolution. Session two on the Exit Rules Amendment will be moderated by the Secretary General of Exit, Ms. Meg Hinier. Meg is also Vice President of the World Bank Group, and as Secretary General of Exit, she oversees a group of 70 staff members who work professionally to administer investment arbitrations. We are also honored to have six prominent professionals in the field of investment arbitration as panelists of the session. Meg, it's a great pleasure and honor to have you, and the stage is yours. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. We pro propose to proceed first by me basically setting the table and giving you a quick overview of some of the main features of the new rules. We are going to save most of our time for our panelists because as you know, you could not get a more thoughtful and knowledgeable group together. So I'd like to take advantage of every second of their expertise as well. And they will be discussing practical aspects of the new rules and their, their thoughts when they read the new rules, what we might expect in practice and how they were designed. So that's how we will proceed today. I have a short PowerPoint and uh, yes, good. You can see it. Um, and it's basically just to give you, as I say, the background and to set the table. Uh, we started the amendments, believe it or not, in late October of 2016, when we told our member states we would like to do some amendments to the exit rules. I will admit to you that we had some ideas in place and never expected it to get quite as large as it did, but it grew in a very good way and in an organic way through our consultations. So that turned out to be a very good thing. We started, I would say, in earnest in 2017, doing a lot of work and pulling together statistics and information on how certain procedures worked under the new rules. And we set up a process to have consultations, not only with member states, which is what you would expect, but we also thought it was very important to have as wide ranging consultations as possible. So we had consultations with arbitrators, council, civil society, academics, and other facility users. And you will see on our exit website, we have kept a record from every set of consultations. Uh, we would ask for comments on the proposals made, and you will see the record of those, which are a very interesting development of how the rule grew from what was originally proposed to what it ultimately ended up being in its adopted format. We had basically four objectives for our rules, and I think you can put most of the rules under various of these buckets. The first was to address time and cost concerns, which are of course a concern in all arbitration, but especially in investment arbitration, which is complex and tends to have large hearings and a lot of counsel and a lot of law involved. And so trying to manage cost and at the same time not affect due process is the challenge that you have. The second thing we wanted to do was to increase transparency of the process. And this is something that ICSID was a leader in in 2006 with our last set of amendments. And so the goal this time was to go even further in terms of transparency. The third set objective is to address what I call the discussion about reform of investor state. And there are a number of aspects to that, but we will talk today about the third party funding rule. And I would say that's probably uh, one of the best examples of discussion that's come up about reform of the investor state dispute settlement process. And then the final objective was to give parties more options about how to settle their disputes. Uh, we know that at least 95% or more of our cases are arbitration, but we also know that there is a thirst for other techniques, conciliation, mediation, and even fact-finding. And so we decided it was important to make sure that all of those options were as widely available to parties as they would wish. We went through, as you can see, uh, a number of iterations. Essentially, we ended up with a working method whereby ICSID would put out what we called a working paper. It would go out for consultation. 
we would have a, an in-person consultation with our member states. We did presentations around the world and we invited written commentary. And then we would take all of that information and come out with working paper number two and the process would repeat. Ultimately, our last working paper was working paper number six. And in March of 2022, we sent the draft resolutions to members saying, this is what we are going to ask you to vote on. And very happily, they were resoundingly approved by 85% of the membership and no member state objected. And I feel that that is a very important piece of information because what it tells me is that the consensus was reached among a very broad group of states and that that is a very good omen for these being implemented uh, as drafted and for there being compliance with these rules because there has been buy-in to the rules over this long process. They came into effect on July 1st of this year and we already have a number of new cases that were commenced under the new rules. And over time, you will see that that will become increasingly part of our jurisprudence and uh, part of the everyday set of rules. ICSID itself has uh, published the text of the rules on our website in searchable format. Uh, but I'm also happy to show you these volumes, which you can imagine are in every bookshelf that I own. Uh, but we were delighted to have these as well. And these are the hard copy, which are also available to parties uh, should they wish. And I brought yesterday a copy to Ministry of Justice, and I have a copy today for, for Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, you will find essentially each separate booklet should give you the tools you need to do a procedure under that set of rules. So essentially the, the blue set of rules is the ICSID convention and the ICSID arbitration rules, the institution rules and the conciliation rules. So this is the one likely we will see the most activity under, but uh, I hope we will see others being used as well. The yellow book is basically everything that's needed for an additional facility case. And there have been some large changes to the additional facility, which I think uh, many practitioners have not yet got their heads around because everybody's busy looking at the blue book. But I also say to people, there's a lot in the yellow book and a lot has changed here. And we'll talk about that this afternoon. The third uh, set of rules are our mediation rules, and this provides a formal framework for parties who want to mediate. And as you probably know, mediation is something that there is a lot of enthusiasm about, and we are all hopeful that mediation will be embraced in investor state. Uh, but we also feel, and we have heard from a number of uh, claimant and investors who say, will states really be willing to mediate? And I think they will, but making sure that states know what these are about, know how to manage them, and uh, are able to use the mediation rules is something that's a very important part of the efforts we're making today to implement these rules. And then lastly, we have our fact-finding rules. And fact-finding is something that was in the exit additional facility before, it has never been used, and uh, we wondered whether we should continue these rules, but we thought we would because they are available for a very unique set of circumstances, but where they might be available, they could be extremely useful. So we felt it was useful to keep these rules. I think in fairness, I would say I expect these to be used the least, but we thought yet again, this is a tool that should be available to parties in an exit case. I wanted to just quickly go over some of the rules uh, under each of the buckets we talked about and just to show you the text of those rules and we'll talk about them in greater detail as we go along. But under the rubric of reducing time and cost, we first uh, looked at why do you have delays? And you'll perhaps not be surprised to know that there is no single cause. So it wasn't as easy as saying, here is the problem, here's how we're going to fix it. There were a number of reasons. Now, there were several that were recurrent. I think one of the uh, things that parties complained about was discovery and how long discovery took. One of the things parties complained about was the time from your final hearing to getting to an award. But we also found a lot of other idiosyncratic causes for delay. So at the end of the day, we decided that we had to attack this from a number of 
uh, approaches, and that's essentially all of these rules would work cumulatively to bring down the time of a proceeding. The first thing we did was perhaps the obvious thing. In a number of places, we reduced the actual number of days in which something had to be done. So for example, the old rule on challenge said you will challenge promptly. And of course, as good lawyers, we saw all sorts of challenges to what does promptly mean? We have now said you will challenge an arbitrator within 21 days after the relevant facts come to light. We have also put an updated declaration for arbitrators to file, and that has an express commitment from the arbitrator that they are available for the case, that they are reasonably available in terms of their schedule. And it even physically has a calendar where days that they're not available has to be marked out so that parties know from the beginning of the case what the availability of the arbitrator is. And if they have a concern that it's not sufficient for their case, that's the time that they can raise it. We also included a number of technological means that help us save time and cost. The first is that all documents are now filed electronically. And we have been doing this at ICSID since the day we were sent home for the pandemic. So uh, necessity is the mother of invention in many ways, and it has gone flawlessly. So documents will be filed electronically. The other electronic tool is in, in uh, remote sessions. And so every kind of a session that is available at ICSID could be done remotely, by video, by telephone, or in hybrid format. And we are seeing, in fact, as we can now go back to hearings in person, parties actually for larger hearings uh, quite like the hybrid format where they bring the core group of counsel and arbitrators in person to the hearing room, but they are also able to have the rest of their team in their home locations following along and as part of, of the process. Um, part of the uh, commitment to reducing time as well was to start off with a fundamental statement, which you see here in rule three, which is essentially that the tribunal and the parties shall conduct the proceedings in good faith and in an expeditious and cost effective manner. And you will see that phrase expeditious and cost effective throughout these rules, but we thought it important to, to frame it with that basic statement in the beginning. The next main issue in terms of time and cost was the time to issue an award or a decision. And that is very important, obviously. There is an expectation, obviously, to issue that kind of a, a document as soon as possible. But in addition, we put specific numeric timeframes. So for example, within 60 days after a manifest lack of legal merit hearing, the document uh, making a decision has to be issued. Importantly for most parties, an award on jurisdiction must be issued within 180 days after the last hearing, and an award on merits and, and jurisdiction must be issued by 240 days, so eight months after the last submission. And uh, this was something interesting that we canvassed many parties and many arbitrators. We wanted something that was doable. We weren't going to put an unrealistic amount of time, but we wanted something that was ambitious. And so we ended up with the 240 days. And uh, as we get new tribunals under the rules, we are alerting them at the very beginning to all of these kinds of provisions and the importance we put on time and cost. And in particular, basically, scheduling from that final period backwards to make sure that those time targets are met. Another important tool was case management conferences. And we heard yesterday about how useful it is to have arbitrators being proactive. And this was a tool to allow arbitrators to proactively take the parties aside and find ways, for example, to identify uncontested facts, to clarify and narrow issues in dispute, and to address any procedural or substantive matter that could be done and set aside so that the, the matters left for the final hearing are increasingly tailored and increasingly focused. And uh, this is one that I believe actually is ripe for some innovation 
We've heard arbitrators talk about various things, uh, decision trees, all sorts of different techniques. And this is an area where I think we're going to be encouraging arbitrators to be creative and try things. And if they work, uh, we will repeat the successes across other tribunals. So uh, today we've asked each of our panelists to give us their idea on a technique that might be useful in case management, just to get us thinking about this. We also updated the manifest lack of legal merit rules. And in particular, there had been some question in the case law about whether it still applied to jurisdiction. And so we made that without doubt. It clearly does apply to jurisdiction, substance, and competence. The timeline changed slightly in that now there is 45 days to file an application, but it is still something that is filed before you get to your first session. And so it's very much at the beginning of the process. Interestingly, if a party succeeds, and that means succeeds fully on the manifest lack of legal merit, they are de facto entitled to their costs unless special circumstances dictate otherwise. And I think that is meant to try to ensure that these applications are not brought as everyday applications. We know there's a high burden of proof. And so it is meant to ensure that they are targeted, focused, manifest lack of legal merit applications. Another area that we looked into was the question of bifurcation. And you will see now there are two bifurcation rules, one that goes to jurisdiction. We in particular ensured that it was clear there is no presumption in favor of bifurcation. And we added in a test for bifurcation, which is one that's quite familiar to all from the rules. Essentially the three-part question of would bifurcation materially reduce the time and cost of the proceeding? If the objection were to succeed, would it dispose of all or substantially all of the hearing? And is the objection that you want to bifurcate so intertwined with the facts of the case that it's really not economic to do it separately? And that's a well-known test from the case law. It's now incorporated into the rule. Another new provision and an interesting one is security for costs, which is new rule 53. Uh, security for costs was something that used to be dealt with as a provisional measure. And so it had to be something urgent and right away, which was something you rarely could uh, prove with a request for security for costs. So it is now a standalone rule and the tribunal has to consider all of the evidence relating to the circumstances around that request for security, including a party's ability and their willingness to comply with an adverse decision on costs, but also on the other hand, the effect that ordering security for costs may have on a party's ability to pursue its claim. And then importantly and inter interestingly, the conduct of both parties in the case. And there were long discussions on consultation about whether third party funding would make security for costs an automatic rule? And the answer is very clearly no. Third party funding is something that the tribunal will obviously know about because it has to be declared, but there is not an automatic link between the fact someone has third party funding and the need for security for costs. So intellectually, the test is designed and tribunals must address those as separate questions. We also, put together a set of expedited rules. And if one followed them 100% to the letter, you would reduce the time of a case by 50%. So they can be extremely effective. Now the expedited rules are by consent of the parties. And so we will see, uh, there will certainly be treaty cases where parties don't feel comfortable with the expedited rules, and that is fine. But I do think there will be a very useful role for expedited proceedings, for example, in contract cases or even in treaty cases where the facts do not appear that complex. So it is available in all cases and the parties are able to decide whether they agree to it in any particular case. In terms of costs, uh, we clarified what types of criteria parties and tribunals should look at in a request for costs. And it should be clear that we do not have the usual cost follows the event. Success on the case is one of several criteria that are listed in these rules. And so it is for the tribunal to add up 
all of these factors. There's also an obligation to give a reasoned cost award so parties understand what the tribunal is looking at when they do or don't make an award of costs in favor of a party. So those are some of the time and cost rules that we looked at. In terms of transparency, our goal was to extend transparency. And in particular, we focused on what I'm calling decisional documents, orders, decisions, and awards. And essentially under the ICSID convention, Awards will continue to be published with consent of the parties. This was frankly a constraint by the convention that we were uh, had to work with. And so we worked with it in that we will follow that rule, but if a party does not advise us within 60 days after our request to publish, whether they do or don't consent, consent will be deemed. So in other words, the circumstances to ensure transparency and publication are as far as we could make them consistent with the ICSID convention. If there is an objection, we will continue to do the legal excerpts as we've been doing in the past. In terms of orders and decisions, all of these documents will be published and the parties have the opportunity to make redactions before they are published. And the goal here is to have them published within 60 days. So I think that is going to be another muscle that council will have to get used to, which will be to redact it orders and decisions relatively soon after they are issued so that they can be made public. The other part of transparency that we worked on was the non-disputing party submission and the non-disputing treaty party submission. For non-disputing parties, that is a rule we have had since 2006 and had a fair amount of experience with. And so we simply added two additional criteria for tribunals to consider when they're asked to give permission. The first being the identity of the non-disputing party and its affiliation to a party. And the second was whether the non-disputing party is receiving funding or assistance. And these are practical circumstances that we had seen arising since the 2006 rules. And so it was felt it was useful to put them into the actual express rule uh, in, in, the, uh, in the rule book. In terms of non-disputing treaty party, uh, you will be aware that many treaties have that kind of provision, but the ICSID rules did not have that provision until now. And so now there is an express ability for a non-disputing treaty party to make a submission, but recall that that is limited to a submission on interpretation of the treaty. So it is the specific function of the other treaty party uh, to come and to advise the tribunal if they feel it's important as to how they viewed the proper interpretation of the terms of the treaty. On to what I think was probably the most discussed rule and the last one to be agreed upon before the package went to member states was the whole question of third party funding. And you will know that that is a topic that garners many different perspectives. And the way this rule approaches third party funding is to avoid inadvertent conflicts of interest. And what it requires is for each party to file a written notice disclosing the fact that they have funding and the identity of the funder. There is no special format for this and it must be done when the case is registered or if funding is obtained later at the time the funding is obtained and it must be kept up to date. So if at a certain point funding changes or funding drops off, that must be disclosed as well. Very clearly, this was not intended to be a discovery or a disclosure rule. And so it does not require, for example, that a party share the funding agreement, which we all know could have a lot of confidential information attorney client information, and frankly, was just not needed for what you want to do here, which is identify, is there a conflict between the funder and the arbitrator? The terms of the agreement make no difference to that. And what you needed was the kind of disclosure uh, that we have uh, provided for. There is a clause, as you will see in rule 14 sub three, which allows a party to ask for further information if need be. But all of that is only according to the test of necessity under Rule 36 and essentially has to go to the basic point of this whole rule, disclosure of the fact of third party funding. 
wanted to move quickly to our additional facility rules to bring these to your attention. They are significantly different and there are some real change to jurisdiction in these rules. In particular, they used to be available, and this I think was a, an odd circumstance, but they used to be available where one of the claimant or the respondent was not affiliated with a ICSID member state. So that's very specific and very complex. We've changed that essentially so that they are available even if both parties are not affiliated with an ICSID member state. And the way I look at this almost is as a circle uh, and it closes the circle. You have cases where both the claimant and respondent are from are affiliated with an ICSID member state. Those are ICSID convention cases. All of the rest are now able to go under the ICSID additional facility. So that's a real leap forward in terms of jurisdiction. The other leap forward that I think is important is that a regional economic integration organization, and we all logically jump to the EU, but we believe there will be other REIOs who sign treaties as an REIO. And it was important to have a set of rules where they could be claimant or they could be respondent. And so the additional facility rules expressly allow an REIO to be a party under those proceedings. In other terms, they are very similar to the ICSID convention rules. So a lot of the things we talk about this afternoon or this morning will be similar in the additional facility. And it's really just the gate into the additional facility. It's the main change I wanted to bring to your attention. Finally, we have our new mediation rules. And again, these were cast intentionally as broadly as possible. So they are available in any dispute relating to investment. So you can take a deep breath and put aside all of those tricky things about the convention and Cellini and all of that. This is a very simple rule that says if you have an investment a dispute relating to investment, these rules will be available. It is not limited to member states or nationals of member states, and it does not have to be in the context of an existing case. It can also be started if there is, for example, a mediation clause in a treaty, but if there is not, and the two parties ad hoc decide we'd like to try mediation, it is available. Uh, it is available at any time during the process. You might want to mediate in the consultation period. You might find after your first hearing that there are some issues that can be mediated to a successful resolution. We've seen parties mediate after a tribunal finding of liability, but avoiding a damages phase. So these are meant in every respect to be as flexible and available as possible. They uh, preserved confidentiality, and we did have an interesting discussion about whether mediation should be transparent, but I think the main feeling was that confidentiality was important to having a successful mediation. And very importantly, they're aligned with the Singapore Convention. So a, a settlement reached under the ICSID mediation rules is one that complies with the Singapore Convention and could be enforceable under that convention, which I think will certainly make them that much more uh, of interest to all parties. So that is my quick setting of the table. And what I would like to do now is to go to our panel. And as I say, you could not get a more knowledgeable and a more thoughtful group of people together. You have their uh, their biographies in your materials. So I would like to just move straight into uh, our conversation. And the way we frame this is we have a number of topics and we have for each topic, one or two, excuse me, two or three speakers, each giving a different perspective on the rule. So if we can start, the first one, we're gonna start with the big one that everybody's so interested in, which is of course, third party funding. And I think well, I will try and stop share, or I'll get Jerry to stop share the, so that you can see, there we go, so that you can see our speakers and uh, at times our speakers will have their own materials. So we wanted to start first on third party funding. And Toby, we were going to ask if you would kick us off here with basically what is happening with respect to third party funding in practice and what's going to be the impact of what's AR 14, rule 14, and this type of rule for ICSID and beyond. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. A great pleasure to, uh, to appear again in, in the forum. Um, 
Funding of both litigation and arbitration is now widespread, and it comes in many different forms, uh, from simple donations and grants to the more controversial topic, which is now commonly referred to as third party funding. I think it's useful just to set the scene of uh, why funding happens and why it's widespread in order to um, think about the significance of the new rule. Um, essentially, third party funding is outside funding by stakeholders that come in many different uh, forms, hedge funds, banks, specialized entities who are fronting the costs of an arbitration in exchange for a share in the future award uh, or some benefit from the award. Traditionally, in many legal systems, there has been great resistance to this uh, because of old doctrines in common law known as maintenance and champerty, and many other systems have the equivalent, which never liked the idea of somebody with no personal interest in a lawsuit gaining a financial goal or, or having a, a financial interest in that lawsuit and, and thereby somehow controlling it. That has completely changed. Uh, third party funding is now widely accepted and many states are busy updating their laws to allow for it, uh, in, in, these, in some instances to encourage it. It, it happens for claimants uh, traditionally who are impecunious, that is, they can't actually afford to proceed with uh, litigation or arbitration, and so they need the funding. And in the investor state setting, that often has been the situation where an investor says that they have no funds because of the conduct of the state. So in order to get justice, they need to have some support to have those costs front loaded, which will be done by a funder. Uh, it's also available to respondent states. States get funding from entities who have got interests in public policy issues or interests in securing a particular kind of award. But I think what's important is to realize that this now goes way beyond impecuniosity. Uh, third party funding is now part of sophisticated liquidity management. Uh, so what we mean by that is that when you're looking at the allocation of capital, uh, in particular for investors, there are decisions that are available as to whether or not to, to apply funds now to arbitration, or rather get somebody else to do it and save liquidity for other purposes. So therefore, a funding arrangement is a way of freeing up working capital. And it, it for example, takes cost liabilities off balance sheets. Uh, and it also is a way of managing risk. So, so the field has expanded in that way. And indeed, post pandemic, it's got even more significant because after the pandemic, there is more generally a crisis in liquidity uh, and, and even more so now with rising interest rates and even more so now with the withdrawal of government stimulus programs after the pandemic. So we are seeing much more resort to third party funding in situations which do not involve a lack of funds, but simply efficiency. There are two broad categories of concern about funding. One of them Meg's already outlined, and that is the principal driver for this rule. And that is the, uh, the need to avoid conflicts of interest. And that can arise in many different ways. For example, tribunal members who are associated with a funder or somebody behind the scenes who has now got a stake in the arbitration. Also more directly, some arbitrators now are members of advisory boards of funding entities. So they are actually advising funders on which cases they should support and which, and which not. And if you step back, you can see that there is great sensitivity in the investor state field because of the kinds of issues that are to be resolved in this kind of arbitration. Uh, it, it is an area where tribunals are mandated to review sensitive questions of sovereign discretion. And that means there's a legitimacy crisis. That means there must be accountability. There must be transparency. And therefore, one issue which is vital to deal with is any possible links or the perception of links between a tribunal and who might actually be behind the scenes pulling the strings. And that will be the funder and all the interests behind the funder itself. And therefore, this rule is absolutely critical in making sure that that is flushed out as soon as possible so that there are no questions later that can undermine the integrity of an award. 
I said there were two concerns. The second one is also about security for costs. There is an interest in knowing whether or not there's third party funding, partly to know whether that indicates impecuniosity on the part, a lack of funds on the part of a party. And secondly, because if somebody is funded, there is a concern that the funder is not subject to the tribunal's jurisdiction and therefore may not actually comply with an adverse costs order. That is a costs order against the funded party. Uh, and therefore, this is also a question as to whether or not people should know that there's funding in order to make more intelligent applications with respect to security for costs. The pre-existing practice was uncertain before this new rule. Um, people were not sure whether this was a matter that tribunals had any right to inquire into. It felt in many cases like it was a tribunal prying into the private arrangements of an arbitrating party. There was resistance to disclosure. There were questions of privilege and confidentiality. Uh, and there was a concern as to how far tribunals could go in actually securing this information. And you can see this uncertainty in commercial arbitration rules now, even recent arbitration rules that are uneven in their treatment of this topic. The ICC rules in 2021 require disclosure. The LCIA rules, LCIA rules of 2020 are silent. Uh, the AIAC rules of 2021 are silent. The SIAC investment rules give a discretion to the tribunal. So I think it's fair to say that this new rule is very welcome because it actually now avoids all of this dispute. It follows on a number of exit cases that did order disclosure before the new rules. For example, the Belmont Resources Slovak Republic case, a famous case where this happened. But now the controversy is actually settled. The rule itself is far reaching in the sense that uh, you have to disclose in every case, whether there is funding from a non-party that's direct or indirect. And if it's a juridical person, you also have to show disclose who is funding behind that juridical person, uh, which is a very, very important point, because sometimes it's quite diffuse to get to the ultimate, ultimate party who is providing the funding. But it's not completely comprehensive, the new rule. As Meg said, it was very controversial in its drafting. It doesn't cover the actual funding agreement because that's, as Meg's explained, not needed really for the conflicts part of this. It also doesn't cover non-monetary forms of assistance. There are ways of funding a case without actually providing money. Uh, and that is complicated. Uh, there's no settled understanding on it, and that is not therefore covered. There are also some questions that remain. So, for example, what happens if an order, if the rule is not complied with? Um, that is something which we do not yet know the answer to. It, it's unlikely uh, that for that to be a common problem, because parties generally do comply with such orders for fear of alienating the tribunal. But we may see that one answer to this is actually Rule 52 1B, which we'll come to later, which is a discretion, a new discretion on the part of the tribunal to allocate costs or assess costs consequent upon a non compliance with a tribunal direction or a rule, uh, uh, um, an arbitration rule. But I'd say finally, just to finish off, that this is, is so welcome that it's now being referred to in non exit cases. And I have referred to it myself, actually, and seen it referred to in non-exit cases where there's a question about disclosure. And people now point to the new Rule 14 as a statement of standard prevailing practice. So I think the exit is to be congratulated on this. And hopefully this will actually stop what is otherwise an area of controversy at the outset of many cases. Thank you, Toby. And in your remarks, you brought us something which I think is really important. Because this was a comprehensive amendment, we were able to make sure that the pieces of the puzzle fit together. So it's not just a third party funding rule. It works with a security for cost rule. It works with the cost rule. And it really is important to make sure all of the pieces work together. I wanted to ask May if she talked to us a little bit about the definition. Uh, that was one of the hard things to try and do in this set of rules. And as well, her, uh, her observations as to the practice in Asia with respect to third-party funding. May, over to you. 
Thanks, Meg, and thanks again for inviting me to participate. As you said, uh, the newly amended definition of what constitutes a third party funder is very broad. I guess reflecting the, the strong desire of states to have a comprehensive definition that covers a wide range of arrangements. Um, and I suppose the intention must be to minimize any lawyer's arguments of interpretation as to who qualifies as a funder and who doesn't. So it's intended to be a catch-all. And this, I think for me, what was, um, what was interesting is that this would include, for example, contingency fees or success fee arrangements with lawyers, um, the direct and indirect um, pro bono legal services, um, types of funds received by donation, um, such as what we saw the Bloomberg Foundation did in relation to uh, Uruguay for the Philip Morris case. And I, I guess from my perspective, and, and particularly wearing um, the hat of a practitioner in Asia, parties are unlikely to be aware of the breadth of disclosure um, and the disclosure obligation and may be caught off guard inadvertently. As Toby mentioned earlier, I think there are a lot, third party funding is obviously um, taking off in Asia. Um, there are a lot of institutes um, that do uh, have reference to third party funding in their rules, but nothing is as comprehensive um, as, as the new exit rules. And so what might happen in Asia, and I'm just predicting here, is that some jurisdictions such as mainland China and Indonesia come to mind, where some form of success fee in local litigation and arbitration is the norm because clients like it when their lawyers have some skin in the game. It's so common in these jurisdictions that no one bats an eyelid at these arrangements. But what might be a concern is that when these parties come um, to participate in exit proceedings, they may not have appreciated the obligation to disclose. And it may also create some complications when it comes to the conflict situation when it, that comes to be assessed, because there are obviously mega law firms in both China and Indonesia that will be involved in many, um, many of the largest disputes. In some of the other jurisdictions, such as Singapore and Hong Kong, success fees is, is just starting to be legalized and to be used uh, in these jurisdictions. And, it, and I suspect parties and their lawyers from these jurisdictions are probably likely to be a bit more cautious and make sure they check what disclosure requirements there are that need to be satisfied. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, some of the regional institutions such as HKIAC, although they require disclosure of third party funding, there is no um, clear definition of what a funder is and parties and their lawyers may not necessarily think it extends to success fees unless they check, um, you know, and exit uh, rules make that much more clear than in the HKIAC rules. But in any event, I think this is very important development, as Toby mentioned, create more creative funding solutions for disputes is definitely a growing trend. So we will definitely bump up against this rule and be you know, using this rule in the future, I suspect. Thank you, May. We wanted to move to bifurcation, which are new rules 42 to 44. And we'll start with Andreas. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the benefits of bifurcation and how it can be used as a tool to save time and money. Thank you very much, Meg. Uh, and thank you again for the invitation. As I said yesterday, it's an enormous pleasure to be here in Tokyo in person. Um, well, let me start by saying that, as we all know, bifurcation refers to the consideration of distinct issues for preliminary determination in a separate phase of, uh, of the proceeding. And it's a very common procedural uh, feature in international arbitration can be applied to issues uh, of the merits such as liability and quantum. Our objection to jurisdiction, which is the fre frequent case in investment treaty uh, arbitration. Indeed, the case load statistic of fixes show how frequent uh, the question of uh, uh, bifurcation arises. So the new rule is of, uh, of a significant practical importance. Um, as we all know, bifurcation has been largely justified as a tool that promotes efficiency. 
saving costs and time on the arbitral uh, proceedings. But this aspect of bifurcation and the benefits on efficiency has, need, has been not exempt of debate. No, and the reason is because not infrequently, bifurcation produces exactly the opposite effect. It creates inefficiencies and more cost and time. So the debate with respect to bifurcation circles around the question on whether to bifurcate or not, and what are the factors has to be taken into account to make that uh, decision. Looking at some available statistics in bifurcation in exit cases uh, where preliminary objections were raised, in my view, shed light on this, on how to answer this practical question. I will go very quickly through this. And I thank ICSID for the, uh, helping with the statistics. Some recent studies made with the occasion of the discussion of the new ICSID rules review 63 cases from January 1, 2015 to 30 June 2017. From these cases, 29 were bifurcated. Of those bifurcated, when the jurisdictional, jurisdictional objection was accepted and therefore the case disposed, the average duration of the case from the constitution of the tribunal was two years, one month. When it was not disposed and the case continued, was five years and two months. In the case not bifurcated, the average was three years, one month. There are similar statistics by, done by Lucy Greenwood in a similar period of time. The results are so similar, so I will not go into detail uh, into them. But what is the obvious conclusion? The obvious conclusion is that if a separate phase ends in determination of the proceeding, there is a relevant saving of time and consequently cost compared to the duration when merits and jurisdiction are heard together. But if the jurisdictional objection is rejected, the duration of the proceeding extends to a significant um, uh, extent or a significant amount. So this background is useful to understand, in my view, the new provision on bifurcation introduced by the 2022 exit arbitration rules. Because the new provision, recognizing the benefits of bifurcation, also recognized the challenges of bifurcation and attempt to find, as I see it, a balance on how to answer the question on when uh, to bifurcate. Prior to the 22 revision or the 22 rules, ICSID convention contained one rule, which is rule 41.2, that allowed for the possibility of bifurcation in the case of preliminary objections without providing details as to the procedure to be followed or the test to be applied. Rule 41.4 uh, in the rules contain, recognize also the tribunal discretion to determine whether to deal with a jurisdictional objection as a preliminary question or join it into the merits of the dispute. This is important. There's, there was no specific rule for bifurcation on other matters different than preliminary objections, but the tribunals based on efficiency considerations and their inherent power to conduct the proceedings, uh, not unfrequently bifurcated the proceedings in issues like uh, liability uh, and quantum. It's important to say that in the in the rule, the 2006 rule, there was no presumption in favor or against uh, bifurcation. So let's now turn to the 22 uh, exit arbitration rules. This rule introduces new two new provisions that contain a detailed procedure uh, providing gui guidance to address a request for bifurcation. The first one, and I will, if someone help and I put in the screen, is Rule 42 which is on the screen, and governs the request for bifurcation of issues other than preliminary objections. As I said, this is, I would say, a new rule because it was not uh, in the former rules. And the second one, which I'll ask to put now on the, on, on, on the screen, is Rule 44, which regulates the request for bifurcation of pre preliminary objections. According to the second working paper, the said regulatory distinction that is expressed in Rule 42 and 44, was made in order, and I quote, to clarify the procedural steps involved in respect of each of these type of requests, including time limits or submitting them and their effects. Notwithstanding, the factors to be considered for bifurcating are the same in both provisions. And as a previous, as a preliminary conclusion, we'll have to see how they apply in the different contexts of jurisdiction and other 
um, other matters such as liability on quantum because obviously they raise different type of, 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 of issues, right? I will turn now my attention to the procedure governing the request for bifurcation of preliminary objections, which is rule 44. And I will do this because of the importance uh, of this rule and the practice that is behind it. I would like to make, uh, to note four elements of rule 44. I don't have time to go through it. Um, and as was mentioned by Meg at the beginning, they relate to an overall uh, overall considerations that we're taking into this rule, which is issues of timing, procedure, and very important, the factors to be considered in a request for bifurcation. So first, what the rule does, and you can see there, it fixes express time limits for submitting the request, rendering a decision on bifurcation, and for rendering a decision or award on the preliminary objections. Uh, so it's a specific amount of time for request for bifurcation of the preliminary objections, the decision on request for bifurcation, the decision or award on, on, on the bifurcated objections, and award if the request is request, uh, rejected. You may note, and some has complained, that this seems to be too prescriptive. Um, my position is completely opposite. I support with enthusiasm the fact that um, this uh, provision streamline the proceeding and give clear guidance to the parties and the tribunal on how much time they should consider in this uh, uh, type of discussion that, as is obvious, can derail a proceeding and take a lot of time. Then uh, the, the rule set forth the relevant uh, procedure. I will skip that part and, uh, and provide for the consequences of the decision. Uh, this is also very clear in my view from the rule. I don't see uh, more complicated issues there. Let me let me spend the last minute in the issue of the factors. Well, what the rule does is following the previous rule, it confirms the tribunal discretion on whether to bifurcate or not ex officio or at the party's request, uh, the proceeding in a case of preliminary objection, establishing the relevant criteria for the tribunal in determining whether to bifurcate or not. Uh, several states uh, were of the opinion that bifurcation should be granted automatically. This is not the position, as I said, it's a balanced position. This is not what the rule does. The rule uh, give uh, there is no presumption in favor or against, and it would be for the tribunal uh, to determine uh, to determine if bifurcates or or not. Um, my last comment here: the rule. Um, the rule doesn't contain something that was in the test that some tribunals used before, which is that the request has to be, let's say, not frivolous, has to be serious and substantive. The request or the preliminary objection raised has to, for bifurcation, has to be serious and substantive. It's not there. My view, since requires efficiency and saving of cost and time, obviously it's indicating to the tribunal that the tribunal has to consider the likelihood of success of the uh, request raised, because otherwise, obviously, as we saw in the statistics, will not be serving any, uh, any, any efficiency and cost. And, and, here I think, and here I think is what, in, in my view, is the most interesting aspect. Uh, some statistics of the last year provided by ICSID show that in the last year, there were 15 requests for bifurcation made to the tribunal, and only one was granted. For me, that is a clear indication that the tribunal are seriously considering that they need to raise the threshold in order to concede or not a bifurcation, because they are mindful that if they get this wrong, it may be putting two years uh, to, the, to the case as opposed to solving, you know, in a shorter time. So one way or the other, what the rule is trying to achieve is already in the practice of the tribunals, raising the threshold. The question for me and with this, and is how the tribunal will combine or will balance the request for efficiency with other considerations that may be relevant in certain cases, such as fairness or procedural justice, where state may consider that in spite of the cost, they shall be entitled to uh, uh, a decision on a preliminary objection uh, done in a previous way. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Brian, do you want to talk to us about your experience with bifurcation and, and the new rules and how they might apply? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, let me first say that it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and let me first thank uh, Andres for those interesting and insightful remarks. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Uh, let's see if this works. Right. Um, Andres, can you see that? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, so let me try to start this. Very good. So um, in following up on Andreas's uh, interesting remarks, I'd like to start with the new rule 42. Uh, that rule, as he said, governs requests for bifurcation on grounds other than the jurisdiction or competence of the tribunal. So such requests could be based, for example, on the contention that the claims are barred by an applicable limitations period, or as we've seen in a couple of recent cases, that the state's intra-EU jurisdictional objection should be dealt with up front. Now, subsection four, which you see on the screen, sets out the decisional rule for tribunals facing request for bifurcation. And as you will see, it's substantive or functionally identical to the corresponding provision in subsection two of rule 44, which Andres has already mentioned. So as you see there on the slide, 42.4 uh, provides that the tribunal shall consider all relevant circumstances, and then proceeds to list three, whether bifurcation would materially reduce the time and cost of the proceeding, whether a decision on the issue to be bifurcated would dispose of all or a large part of the case, and whether the issue that the moving party seeks to bifurcate is so intertwined with facts uh, that bifurcation would be impractical. So put another way, rule 42.4, like rule 44.2, rightly focuses on whether bifurcation is likely to be efficient. For example, if deciding a preliminary issue may dispose of the case as a whole, then bifurcation may well save time and costs. On the other hand, if the uh, preliminary issue that's suggested is highly intertwined with the facts, bifurcation will likely be inefficient because the tribunal may end up having to hear the same evidence, hear the same evidence twice. I'll just end this now if I can. Um, so now, as Andres has, has noted, there's been some interesting quantitative work done recently by ICSID and by others on the extent to which bifurcation, and by that I mean any bifurcation, including of jurisdiction, actually promotes efficiency in investor state arbitration. I agree with Andres that the lesson taught by these studies seems very clear. Bifurcation is efficient if the bifurcated objection succeeds and the case is dismissed. However, where the objection fails, bifurcation lengthens the proceedings substantially, somewhere between apparently two and three years. Uh, and a corollary to this is that the party's costs also increase substantially. So moving back to rule 42.4, you'll recall, as Andres noted, that the enumerated circumstances that the tribunal shall consider do not expressly include the perceived merits of the preliminary issue or objection. But of course, the rule also tells the arbitrators to consider all relevant circumstances, so tribunals would be free to consider the apparent strength of the moving party's argument on the issue sought to be bifurcated. Now, as you know, in practice, arbitrators are typically very reluctant to take any view on the merits at an early stage of the case. That's, of course, understandable. Otherwise, they may risk being perceived as, as exercising prejudgment. But at least in my view, and I think Andres and I agree on this, this does not mean that some limited consideration of the merits of a particular argument is off limits, even at an early stage of the case. And that may be particularly important where there, was a, where there is a request for bifurcation at issue, because as we have seen, the data suggests that bifurcation saves time and costs if the preliminary objection succeeds and ends the case. And indeed, as Andres noted, investment arbitration tribunals facing bifurcation requests have typically been willing to give at least some consideration to the merits of the issue sought to be bifurcated. An example, and I'll conclude on this, that I would mention is the bifurcation decision of the tribunal in Glencore against Bolivia. The respondent in that case had advanced four preliminary objections that it sought to have bifurcated, and the tribunal in assessing that applied as one element of its test, whether each objection was, and I quote, sufficiently serious and substantial as to justify bifurcation. And in the end, it decided not to bifurcate any of them. <clears throat> and to me, at least, the Glencore Tribunal's approach seems to strike the right balance. We know that where proceedings are bifurcated and the objection is dismissed, 
efficiency is unlikely to be served. And so it makes sense that in deciding whether to bifurcate, a tribunal should assess as part of the test whether the preliminary objection appears substantial enough to justify that risk. Thank you very much, I'll stop there. Thank you. Brian, can you move us on to a consideration of manifest lack of legal merit? Absolutely. Um, let me once again attempt to share. Um, sorry, just one second. Ah, yeah, here we go. You share. I apologize for my um, unimpressive felicity with the platform. I think you have to go in presentation mode. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, I, I'll, I'll, I'll do without the slides if it can't be done. Is it not sharing now? Not yet. Okay, try again. Okay, it says I'm screen sharing, but I don't know if people can see it. Um, any, any, any joy? If not, then... Yeah, we've got it. Okay, very good, very good. Sorry for the delay there. Okay, so um, it's, it's my pleasure to be a speaker on this topic, uh, the manifest lack of legal merit provision in the rules. It's a topic of great interest to me, uh, in part because I was counsel in one of the first cases to dismiss uh, all claims on that basis. And I'll come back to that in a minute. It was an interesting case. But let me begin by showing you the new rule and how it differs from its predecessor, which was rule 41 sub five in the 2006 version of the rules. That provision was just one part of a broader rule on preliminary objections. The new rules have now separated out into a standalone rule of its own. So what are the main changes in the new 2022 version of the provision? I've tried to highlight its key features on the slide. First, as Meg mentioned, subsection one clarifies consistent with what arbitral tribunals had decided under the prior version that the objection of manifest lack of legal merit can relate to the jurisdiction or competence of the tribunal as well as the substance of the claim. Next, subsection two sets relatively short deadlines for the application and a decision on it. An application to dismiss uh, a claim or claims under Rule 41 must be filed within 45 days of the constitution of the tribunal, and the tribunal has to render its decision within 60 days of the final submission or its constitution, whichever is later. Um, and third, uh, subsection three specifies that if the tribunal finds that all of the claimant's claims are manifestly without legal merit, it will issue an award dismissing the case. And again, as Meg has mentioned, we then move to 52.2, um, which is also on the slide, which provides that if the case is dismissed on that basis, then in principle, the prevailing party should get its costs. Now, I think that in order to understand the purpose and scope of application of Rule 41, it's useful to consider its history. As I've said, its precursor was Rule 41.5, the prior version of the rules. Now, Rule 41.5 was introduced in 2006. States advocated for its adoption because they wanted to have a relatively quick mechanism for obtaining the dismissal of facially non-meritorious claims. In the first three years of its existence, uh, Rule 41.5 was only invoked twice. The application was dismissed in one of those cases and was upheld in the other, but only as to one of the claimant's three claims. So a sparsely used procedure. But that all changed in December of 2010. Within a space of 10 days, two tribunals dismissed cases as manifestly lacking legal merit. Uh, one of those was RSM against Grenada, uh, where I had the pleasure of acting for the state. And I think it provides a good example of how the provision works. So let me say a few words about that. So in that case, the US company RSM and its three shareholders <clears throat> excuse me, brought bid claims against Grenada, claiming in essence that the state had expropriated or otherwise nullified the company's oil concession contract with the state. There had, however, been a prior contractual arbitration in which another exit tribunal had determined that the state had lawfully terminated the concession contract. And so in the bid case, the state filed an application for dismissal under Rule 41.5, which the tribunal granted. The tribunal first decided that RSM shareholders were in privity with RSM, such that the award in the earlier case bound both them and the company. The tribunal then applied the principle of collateral estoppel 
reasoning that there could be no violation of the BIT in respect of contractual rights that had been found to have been lawfully terminated. And the tribunal therefore dismissed the case as a whole with costs against the claimant. So the key point was this. The tribunal determined that even if the facts alleged by the claimants were true, they had no viable claim as a matter of law. And that is precisely how Rule 41.5 and the new Rule 41 are intended to operate. There must be a manifest, that is clear and relatively obvious, legal impediment to the claim. Now, subsequent to 2010, states have raised the manifest lack of legal merit objection with greater frequency. The statistics of ICSID show that as of March 2021, there had been a total of 40 applications out of 754 total cases, so a, a minority, but 40 applications. And of those, the claims were dismissed in full in seven cases and in part in four others, while the objection was rejected in 26 cases. So doing the math, in those cases where an application was made, which was again a, a small minority of the total cases, it disposed of the case about 26% of the time. Nevertheless, as Meg has said, the standard set by Rule 41 is a stringent one. The app show that the class will merit and effectively interpreted clearly and obviously. And lack of legal merit means what it says, that the claim fails as a matter of law. So if there are factual disputes that would have to be resolved in order to decide on a Rule 41 application, or if the principle of law invoked by the applicant is debatable, then the application will fail. So what kind of circumstances can satisfy the Rule 41 standard? From the decided cases, I think we can identify three categories of cases where the defense has succeeded. First, where the claim has been brought beyond the applicable limitations period, and some treaties have that. Second, where, as in the RSM case, it is clear that the claimant has no actionable property right. And third, where it is clear that the state has not consented to arbitrate under the relevant investment treaty. So to conclude, Rule 41 is a narrowly tailored but important feature of the new rules. It sets a high standard for the applicant party but has been successful in accomplishing, or at least its predecessor, and now it, successful in accomplishing the main purpose of weeding out plainly non-meritorious claims at a very early stage. And that success is, I think, reflected in the fact that since 2016, several other arbitral institutions have adopted similar rules to include the SEAC, the HKIC, the SCC, and CTOC. It's often said that imitation is a sincerest form of flattery, and so it is here too. And with that, um, I will turn the floor over to my colleague. Brian, for such thorough presentation, I think you provide us a very good overview of the rules and uh, how it works. I will just make two, only two comments. Both of those comments relate to the scope uh, of Rule 41.5. The first one is that the rule is only applicable to claims as is uh, established in the rule. This is something that was debated during the, uh, during the discussion and adoption of, uh, of the rules. And what you can find in the working paper is that since the purpose of Rule 41 is to uh, dispose of the case at an early stage of the proceedings, counter claims and defenses are generally filed at a later stage of the proceeding and therefore, you know, uh, therefore um, should not be considered. So it was clearly stated that it's, it's not available for defenses. Um, and therefore, one would say solely for respondents. But um, having said that, uh, that limitation is in contract of the rules that you mentioned at the end, uh, Brian, of your presentation. Actually, if you look at the, at the rules that are mostly for commercial purpose, to be fair, or with these rules in SEC and SEAC, they include defenses for manifestly lack of legal merit and even rules in HKAI. AC includes questions of fact uh, as well. Uh, so this rule has a broader scope and as I said, can be explained for, because these rules apply to commercial dispute, not investment dispute. But having said that, 
uh, as was discussed uh, previously, and it's also some in, uh, discussion in the working paper, uh, rule 42 that you discussed uh, before is a rule that perfectly may give space to discuss, you know, when a defense uh, or uh, a cartel claim required to be resolved for expeditious reasons uh, in a summary fashion because lack legal merit. So obviously there is a response of the rule for this request, for a possible request with respect to defenses or cartel claim. As Max said, a systematic look at the rules provides a good answer for this issue. The second, the second comment uh, relates also to scope and is the application of rule 41, previous rule 41.5, not just to claims or jurisdictional objections, uh, sorry, not just to against claim for jurisdiction or objections or problems in uh, in the claim for being unmeritorious from a legal point of view, but also in annulment proceedings or request for revision. Since you were involved in these cases, I also was involved uh, as a chair of the committee, the first committee that had to deal with the question uh, if annulment was or not subject, the request for annulment was or not subject to rule 41, 41.5, that was the case of Elsamex uh, versus on Honduras. And we reached the conclusion that considering the purpose of rule 41.5, that is avoiding unnecessary and costly proceedings uh, and with the application of rule 53, which is the rules that makes, you know, the arbitration rules applicable to a normal proceeding mutatis mutandis, it led us to conclude that this rule was applicable with, um, within annulment proceedings. Interestingly, we also uh, conclude, and this is something that has been followed by other committees, that the threshold was higher, that the test was higher when it comes to an annulment, among other things, because if you dispose of the case, there is no subsequent possibility of raise this issue, as it would be the case, you know, within a normal um, uh, proceeding. And therefore, if you look at uh, uh, following cases, you will find that the case somehow has uh, been consistent in applying the decision that was taken by the Elsa Max committee. And also uh, in, 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 in the case infrared versus Spain was also uncontroversially admitted in a case of uh, a request for revision. Was no dispute between the parties that that was applicable, was rejected by, 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 um, by other reasons. So even though, so as concluding, even though rule 41 doesn't contain explicitly or make explicit reference to annulment or to the request for revision. I think it should be uncontroversial that following the practice and decision of previous ex tribunal for the same reasons that these committees uh, decided that the rule will also be applicable in case of annulment or request for revision. Thank you. Thank you. These are, this is the short snapper part. Of the, uh... We asked each of our members of the panel to give us uh, one thought or one idea about how you could use the case management conference. So can I start, Toby, with you? <laughs> so this takes us into the controversial territory of yesterday, and it gives me an opportunity to give some further rejoinders to the points put against me on case management. Can I just quickly put the, uh, put the rule into context and then give you some thoughts? Um, rule 31, which uh, Meg has already set out, um, it is a short rule, but it's absolutely critical. What it does is it mandates a tribunal to convene one or more case management conferences at any time after the first session. Now, to, to understand how important this is, one can really have, one has to go back to the essence of what arbitration is supposed to be. It's supposed to be flexible. It's supposed to be cost and time efficient, and it's supposed to be tailored to the needs of the particular dispute. And what we found in practice is that it's not that. Because arbitration has become very standardized, what tends to happen is what I, what I call um, pejoratively as arbitral autopilot, which is that you start with a standardized procedural order number one, and that's put together at a first session with the tribunal in exit. And then the next time that the tribunal will be actively engaged with the parties can sometimes be the hearing. And what's happened in between 
is that everybody has gone off to do whatever they do in their other cases, but the tribunal in particular is not monitoring actively. And so that so that there's a natural course that takes place in these in these cases following a pretty extensive written phase and uh, uh, of, of memorials ending up in an extensive hearing without anybody pausing along the way to ask the question, is all of this still needed? Do we still need to have every step that was set out in the standard procedural order number one? Now, certainly in some major cases, the answer is yes, you do need it but not in every case. There are many cases where actually, if the tribunal were to be fully engaged before the hearing in the course of the process, they would be able to guide the parties towards identifying early on what really are the issues that matter? What are the issues that do not matter anymore? What's the procedure that actually is going to be redundant at the end of the day? And where can we make economies of costs and time? You can only do that by a tribunal being actively engaged, rolling up its sleeves uh, and actually meeting with the parties along the way. And that is the spirit of this new rule, which is to mandate that there be at least one case management conference before you get to the hearing. If you don't do that, the, the, or you don't do that effectively, what happens is, is which is not uncommon now, the tribunal will sit quite passively, listening to the submissions, receiving extensive written and oral submissions. But when they actually retire to their deliberations, there is a fundamental mismatch between the volume of material that they've been presented with and what actually matters to decide the dispute. There will be a lot that never matters at all. And that will reflect costs and time that has actually been wasted. So the result of this is that one needs to, in my view, treat this new rule as a mandate to the tribunal to be proactive, not to be passive, not to take the view that really the parties know best or their lawyers know best. It's true that the lawyers will know more than the tribunal, of course. But equally, the tribunal is able to ramp up in a way that it will have to in the end to ramp up earlier than the actual hearing. So, so what may happen at an effective case management conference? Well, many things can happen, but just give you to give some suggestions. If the tribunal has actually done the work, uh, what, what may be clear at a case management conference? For example, after the first exchange of memorials, before document production, before the second exchange of memorials, if one's following a standard procedure, standard sequence, it may be clear that actually of uh, you know, 20 disputed points, there are three that really matter. Or it may be clear that five are never gonna matter. In fact, they're, they're, they are moot. Um, and it may be clear that the parties um, actually have agreed areas which can actually be taken out of account because there's more common ground than they will accept or readily admit. So that kind of exercise is, is active management of the issues to narrow down before you get to document disclosure, before you get to a second round of memorials. And my experience, many people's experience, I think, is that you can actually make very substantial savings at that point. You can direct all sorts of things. You can direct what, what witnesses maybe are needed and, and perhaps suggest which may not be needed, or what the witnesses should actually deal with and what they don't need to deal with, because it may be easier to, to deal with some issues by submission. I think what to make this effective, there are a number of points that we have to um, focus on. Number one, we need to have tribunals that are courageous. And the problem is that many have what is known as due process paranoia, which means they're fearful of doing too much for fear of being uh, prejudging or giving a perception of prejudgment. And that actually is something that needs to be managed itself because there's no reason why any of this should lead to a setting aside or challenge or a, or a prejudgment accusation if it's done diplomatically and carefully. And of course, it has to be done in a measured way. Uh, this is not an argument for tribunals to take over. Uh, and to dominate. It's for tribunals to guide and to give the benefit of their objective view. 
as to what actually will matter to them at the end of the day. And secondly, it requires tribunals to be engaged earlier. Uh, and that is a problem, especially for busy arbitrators who often are over trading and don't have the time to roll up their sleeves early enough. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, what I'd say is that for those who doubt that this can work, uh, we have evidence that it does work because there are cases that have been actively case managed and saved a huge amount. And we also have something that I mentioned yesterday, which is the competition now of other international fora such as the SICC in Singapore, that have international tribunals that look a lot like arbitration, but they are applying the discipline of court style case management with great success. So I think uh, this is a, a focus which, um, a short provision that really everybody must focus on now and hopefully will lead to a general mindset change. Emmanuel, what are your thoughts? Uh, thanks, Max. Th thanks, Toby, and a uh, very good morning to, to everyone. And and and, and thank you to uh, Ixid and, and the Ministry of Justice for um, inviting me this morning. I I agree with everything you said, um, Toby. But I, I, maybe I would add one small caveat, wearing my practitioner's hat uh, here. We we've seen a, a multiplication of regular case management conferences um, in recent years, both in the context of investment arbitration and also commercial arbitration. And and my experience is that they are not always very well used. Uh, as much as I agree that the autopilot form of of arbitration is probably neither desirable nor adapted to the party's needs today, uh, sometimes you see the extreme opposite, which I would call self-driving arbitration or do-it-yourself arbitration maybe. Um, and, and this is not de desirable either. Um, I, I've had cases where case management conferences were organized at every single step of the arbitration without visibility as to where the case was going, without any planning. And, and, and that's a real issue for two reasons. Number one, because it gives uh, parties an opportunity to argue on procedure at every single step of the arbitration and derail the proceedings. Number two, because it creates scheduling issue. And as you said, we are all very busy. Arbitrators are very busy. And so it's very difficult when you get to the next case management conference to find dates that are suitable for everyone for the upcoming steps of the proceedings. And at the end of the day, in those cases, we ended up with a procedure that was in fact longer and more costly than if we had had the typical autopilot type of arbitration. So I, I would say yes to case management conferences, but, but on two conditions. One, that it doesn't prevent arbitrators from providing the parties with a roadmap at the outset of the proceedings of what's going to happen until the end of the arbitration. Maybe not as detailed as in the past, but at least that the parties know where they're going. And number two, and, and you said it, it requires that arbitrators are actively engaged in the process and that at each case management conference, they are able to give guidance to the parties as to what they consider the important issues in the case are so that the parties know what they should be dealing with and, and what's important in the eyes of, of the arbitrators. Other than that, fully agree with everything you've said to me. Thank you. Brian, some ideas about uh, case management. Brian, we've got you on mute here. My fault. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Meg. Uh, yeah, I actually had three in mind um, uh, for expediting the resolution of the dispute, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna pick one and I'll try to pick the one that I think is the most interesting. And this is one that uh, a technique that was first uh, proposed or suggested to me by the general counsel of a large uh, corporation. And it is that procedural order number one would require, this is what he wanted in his, would require the parties to exchange Calder Bank offers after each round of written submissions. Now, the audience will know that Calder Bank offers are an English invention that's found its way into international arbitration practice. And in short, these are sealed settlement offers that the parties exchange with each other, uh, but don't share with the tribunal unless and until an award is rendered. And if the relief awarded to a party turns out to be less than what the counterparty offered in its Calder Bank, then in principle, that party will be required to pay the counterparty's costs from the date of the offer forward. Now, what this does, of course, is to provide an incentive for settlement. Settlement offers are baked into the process, so you don't have to feel embarrassed about doing it as a party. 
and unreasonable rejections of them may have substantial cost consequences. I should say, I don't think this is something that I would mandate as arbitrator, but I think it can reasonably be raised uh, for the party's consideration at the outset. And with that, I'll pass the floor. Andreas? Thank you very much, Meg. We, I think I discussed already with, with Toby what I had to discuss yesterday, and Emmanuel made the points that I made yesterday, so I don't think I need to, to repeat. Uh, which is the caveat or the cautious that you have to have with this instrument. Having said that, I think I'm also very welcome the, the new provision because being mandatory and with specific content, it will change somehow the cultural, the discipline of the arbitrator, will require them to think that they need to somehow get the parties to focus on the issues, on possible ways of uh, making the procedure more efficient, etc. So... Um, in that sense, having a rule that is a mandatory rule uh, and it's not the first session, clearly, I think, will change the dynamic or likely change the dynamics. I do, I do favor, obviously, obviously, obviously that. Um, the, the, even I think I would like to highlight that now the rule, I think it's 19.3b, will require arbitrators to express that they're available not just you know free of conflict and that's something also that the institution should take very seriously when engaged in um, uh, when appoint arbitrators so, uh, why is that because as i said yesterday and i repeat now you need to somehow change the culture and in order for this would be a good pilot and not a pilot that will crash the plane and therefore you know where you would prefer the autopilot instead of that you need an arbitrator that will be engaged uh, in an early stage of the proceeding with the case, with the pleadings, with the parties, and therefore we will be able to properly manage. Uh, and that require, in some arbitrators, at least some, I would say, cultural change in the way they address uh, the case. But I and I think that putting the rule out there will produce that. It will it will change uh, culture. So I very welcome the provision. Yoshimi. Yes, um, thank you very much for introduction and thank you for having me once again at this EXIT and MOJ conference. Um, in my experience, I have to say um, midstream conference is quite limited, unfortunately, and I believe this new rule will you know, encourage parties um, and tribunal to engage uh, in proceedings uh, at the early stage. In my view, um, the limited use of midstream conference uh, or a case management conference in the middle of proceeding may somewhat come from, derive from um, legal background differences. For example, um, I'm trained um, and trained in practice both in you know common law jurisdiction and civil law jurisdictions. But in my impression, civil law jurisdictions, judges were more you know um, inquis inquisitorial, um, being not afraid um, of um, asking questions, um, core questions to the parties at the outset of proceeding to streamline the process to limit the issues at the outset. And that benefit the parties who are asked because that party can focus their submissions um, in their next round. So uh, this new rule, I hope, will streamline the process. Thank you. And May, for a last quick word on CMPCs. Thanks, Meg. I I've loved all of the suggestions so far. Um, my experience is that during the pandemic, I was before an exit tribunal who was very willing to get on calls with the parties, organize at, at the last minute on at least one occasion on a Sunday to deal with some very urgent and tricky procedural issues. This was not something I, I personally anyway had experienced before the pandemic as tribunals had tended to be more formal, asking for a couple round of written submissions and then dealing with, with these issues on paper, generally speaking. I, I think in, in my experience, um, the parties appreciated the flexibility um, and for certain issues, it was more effective and certainly more cost effective to deal with it orally through a discussion rather than in writing where you would have to cite authorities and you know, you know, generally make it longer than it's necessary. Um, and perhaps this was more straightforward to do during the pandemic because uh, for the most part, everyone was at home and generally more available. 
but all of these cases are always very well lawyered and it's it's not necessary for everyone to be available for for the parties in the tribunal to get on a call very quickly um a, a second point i guess is that generally speaking it is always to me very helpful when the tribunal proactively raises possibilities and issues uh, it helps the parties because anything that's proposed by one side is often looked at with suspicion by the other side um, or counsel oftentimes doesn't want to raise an obvious point for fear of upsetting their clients. So uh, for example, it would be very useful for tribunals to feel empowered to proactively encourage early discussions on challenges to jurisdiction or bifurcation requests, even if the deadline for raising these comes much later, uh, to get an early indication would be very helpful for planning uh, for the future procedures. Thank you. Terrific, thank you. Uh, we wanna to move to costs and Toby, Costs can be a case management tool. How, how is that? Uh, yes, it, indeed it can. And I think that this is something which um, tribunals are waking up to, uh, which traditionally they've not really thought about. The, the background on costs is that in investor state arbitration, there used to be a divide between those who came to the field with uh, assumptions of public international law and those who came to the field from a commercial arbitration background. In the first category of sort of pure public international law practitioners, there was a reluctance to engage with costs at all uh, because that's not generally done in interstate proceedings. So the early, early awards really just left costs to lie uh, where, where they fell. So there was no allocation or assessment of costs or no orders as to costs. The, the grubby commercial practitioners who have infected this area, um, many arbitrators who have not come from pure public international law, but rather commercial arbitration, have brought with them the practices of commercial arbitration where costs are routinely assessed and allocated. Uh, but even then, for a long time, I think in, in the investor state field, costs were really a neglected part of the process. Um, there wasn't that much attention paid to them. And there was very limited reasoning on costs when you got to the end of awards or the end of a process. Now, the realization that's now come, and I think has really driven the, the new rules, rules 50 to 52, are that firstly, costs can be a very significant element in terms of actual money. In, in major um, investor state cases, we are talking normally about millions of dollars in costs. And sometimes in the bigger cases, it's tens of millions, uh, uh, eye-watering amounts that actually have to be allocated somehow and assessed somehow. And that is an assessment that needs proper attention. And so the new rule is incredibly uh, valuable, especially rule 51, in requiring detailed submissions on costs, uh, which haven't always been the norm. But then the question is, how do you then deal with allocation and assessment and how might that impact on case management? And the answer is there is a direct connection because if parties know from the outset that the steps they take in the arbitration will have a cost consequence, that focuses the mind of parties uh, in a way that, that actually is very, very effective. Parties are now told by rule 52 of the new rules that it's not just the outcome of the proceeding that will determine how costs are allocated, but both the assessment and the allocation of costs will turn on their conduct. And the conduct uh, is, is detailed in Rule 52 as, as by reference to whether or not they have acted in an expeditious and cost effective manner, as well as the extent to which they've complied with the rules and the tribunal's directions. If the tribunal is asking the parties to act in a certain way to save time and costs and parties don't do that, then there will be the potential for a penalty and costs. And that feeds right back into the beginning of the process. So I think how case management works now in, in, or how it can work in a costs context is that costs are not just left to the end of the process. They have to be thought about at the beginning. And as procedural order number one is framed, the tribunal can now with good reason 
remind the parties that if they want a procedural step, then there will be a cost consequence. Uh, and it may be that that's something which they will want to bear or and risk. And it may be they don't want to risk it. One a tribunal can now say to a party, we will give you an indulgence, but bear in mind that, that if this actually um, we find against you, then this may mean you have to pay more costs on this particular procedural step. I think it goes one step further than that even, but we'll have to see whether or not tribunals have the courage to do this. As, as well as indicating that there will be costs consequences, tribunals are able in theory to actually cap costs, to limit recoverable costs. Um, and that would be to say, for example, to a party, we will allow costs to be recovered up to a certain ceiling. Beyond that, if you spend more than that on a part of the process, those costs will not be recoverable. Uh, again, you need courage to do that. And, and not all arbitrators will have a clear enough picture of all the facts and the ability to do that. But there is scope for that in, ter in terms of case management. Lastly, I just want to just make the point that there are difficulties in exercising this discretion on costs. Because from a tribunal's perspective, sometimes it can be difficult to assess what is reasonable and what isn't. Especially, if, if I can say this rather bluntly, for those arbitrators who have not been counsel or have not been counsel for many years. Because sometimes one loses touch with what are current practices as counsel and what are reasonable costs. Um, and, and there are arbitrators who, who, who are shocked by costs because of the level of them, whereas other arbitrators would regard the same costs as really just standard. That's, that's actually how much lawyers do charge, and that is acceptable. So I think there, there is a, perhaps a need for arbitrators to educate themselves uh, and to become as best informed as possible on prevailing costs approaches and charging approaches. Uh, and then ultimately, one's always left with the assessment at the end as arbitrator as to whether parties have behaved appropriately. Um, there's a, there are difficulties in assessing who's won the case often, but there are also difficulties then and will be difficulties now in assessing uh, compliance, whether compliance was proper, whether if it wasn't proper, whether it was excused um, or should be excusable. Uh, and those are matters, I think, which are, are new territory to be explored. Thank you. Emmanuel, any thoughts to add? Thanks, May. I have very little to add to, to what Toby has said. He's almost said everything. Um, but, but maybe three small points. Um, number one, the, I, I believe those new rules are, are very welcome in addressing one of the criticisms um, that was made against exit proceedings in the past. Um, I think even in, in the words of one tribunal, that decisions on cost were arbitrary and unpredictable. Um, and, and, and as Toby said, given the importance of, of cost in, in, in millions in those proceedings, um, that, is, that is indeed um, extremely welcome. It will also align um, decisions on cost to the recent practice of, of uh, exit arbitral tribunals. Um, in, in the past, uh, most arbitral tribunals had a tendency to follow the rules which uh, Toby mentioned uh, coming from um, public international law, the pay your own way principle, where tribunals will um, uh, very often um, uh, decide that each party should bear their own cost. And, and, and here I found a statistic, 55% of exit tribunal ordering parties to bear their own cost until 2017. Now, since 2017, that practice has drastically changed. And, and the number of arbitral tribunals ordering parties to bear their own cost in the context of exit proceedings has fallen to 25%. So 75% um, of tribunals since 2017 actually follow this rule coming from uh, commercial arbitration of losers the loser pay principle or a variation of, of the loser pay principle. So these new rules are, are fully aligned with um, the, the, the more recent practice of, of exit. The, the second point I wanted to make um, uh, is, is about uh, Rule 41.3, uh, which was mentioned by Brian earlier. But since we are talking about cost, uh, I think it's, it's quite significant because it reverses the default rule as to how costs should be 
uh, attributed, and that's in the context of proceedings for uh, manifest lack of merits. If the tribunal decides to dismiss the case for manifest lack of merits, then Rule 52.3 provides that the tribunal shall award its cost to uh, the prevailing party. So the rule is, is, is reversed, and it's only in exceptional circumstances that the, can, the tribunal will decide, will be able to decide otherwise. And that's very welcome as well to, um, um, to um, uh, prevent parties from filing um, a, a meritorious uh, a claim. Last point I want to make very briefly is about recovery. And, and we talked about the possibility of arbitral tribunal to issue interim decisions on cost. And, and, and this is also very welcome um, based on my experience. Um, the advantage of those interim decisions of cost on cost, if indeed tribunals uh, follow that rule, is that it will probably make it easier for states to recover awards on cost made against the claimant. In, in the current system or in the old system, it very often happened that even when states were successful and a cost award was made against the investor, it was very difficult for states to recover that money in, in some of the cases, either because the investor was a special purpose vehicle with no assets or because the investor would simply disappear at the end of the arbitral proceedings. And so if decisions on cost are made in the course of the proceedings, it is likely that the investors will have more incentive to voluntarily comply with those decisions on cost because it will affect potentially their um, position in the remaining phases of the arbitration. And if the cost decisions are made in the form of an award, it will also likely make it easier for states to enforce these awards against the investor because the investor is likely to at least remain alive until the end of the arbitration proceedings. So these are the, the, the three additional points that I would make in, in that respect. It's tremendous. Yoshimi, any point to add? Well, I have only, you know, very limited point to add because, you know, everything has been said. Um, I entirely agree. Um, I'm very happy to have this new rule as an arbitrator for two reasons. Number one, you know, now it's always hard for arbitrator to come up with good reasons unless, you know, uh, institutional rules or notes to the parties provide guidance about how discretion tribunal can exercise their discretion. Um, it is uh, agreed and understood that um, tribunal has discretion, uh, has um, vast ex um, discretion um, to exercise in issuing cost award, uh, but uh, limited institutional rules provide guidance. And these rules provide clear guidance. And um, based on that, you know, arbitrator can easily come up with reasoning. And the second, second point, uh, which is more important, um, as Toby highlighted, uh, in comparison with SICC, compared to uh, court judges, arbitrator has limited tools to discipline parties and, and cost award is one of those um, effective tools to discipline parties. And now it is clearly set out in the rules that you know, unless parties behave well, uh, there's a cost consequence. And this is truly helpful for the party to guide the, part, guide the part, tribunal, to guide the parties to conduct the arbitral proceedings in an expeditious manner. Thank you. Terrific. Let's move to security for costs. And Brian, will you open that up for us? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the relevant provision here, as Meg has already said, is Arbitration Rule 53, which was added in 2022. Now, you'll all be familiar with security cost app for costs applications. Essentially, the responding party argues that the claimant, if it loses, will be unable or unwilling to pay an adverse cost award and therefore that the tribunal should order the claimant to post security, typically in the form of a bank guarantee, to cover that potential future costs award. And the underlying theory is to avoid what's often called arbitral hit and run, uh, meaning that if the claimant uh, wins, it recovers, but if it loses, the respondent's left entirely without any remedy and costs. Now I'll now try to, to do a last screen share. I can. Okay. Okay, yeah, I think, so. I think that worked. So while Rule 53 is new, it largely codifies uh, pre-existing practices of exit tribunals 
Prior to the rule's adoption, respondents sometimes sought security for costs by requesting them, requesting it as a provisional measure under what was then Rule 39. And the first tribunal to grant that relief was one impaneled in a case that coincidentally involved the same. Oh, sorry, gotta go back one. The same um, U.S. company RSM that I mentioned earlier. So this time, the respondent was the government of Saint Lucia. And it asked for a provisional measure of security for costs on the grounds that RSM first appeared to be impecunious, didn't have any money. Secondly, had failed to satisfy earlier costs awards, including in ICSID cases. And third, was funded by a third party. And in response, RSM said, among other things, that it risked being denied uh, the chance to pursue its claims if security for costs were granted. Now, the tribunal held that the fact that a claimant is impecunious standing alone is not enough to justify a security for cost order, but it went on to find that the circumstances that St. Lucia had raised were exceptional and supported the finding that RSM would be unwilling or unable to satisfy an adverse cost award. The tribunal therefore ordered RSM uh, to post security for costs and when it failed to do so repeatedly, the tribunal dismissed the claims with prejudice. Thereafter, RSM sought to annul the award on various grounds, and those were all rejected, except that the annul committee did hold that the tribunal went too far in dismissing the case with prejudice and should instead have discontinued it without prejudice to reinstatement. So the RSM case laid down the essential procedural framework that was followed by tribunals thereafter, and which is also reflected in the new Rule 53, which you now see in excerpted form on the slide. Its main features are as follows. First, subsection one authorizes any party against whom a claim has been made to request security for costs, not anymore as a provisional measure, but under the new standalone rule. Subsection three instructs the tribunal to uh, consider all relevant circumstances in evaluating the application including the claimant's ability and willingness to comply with an adverse cost award, whether granting security might make it difficult or impossible uh, for the claimant to pursue its claims, and the conduct of the parties. Subsection four then makes clear that the presence of a third party funder can be relevant, and I think my colleagues will say more about that. And then subsection six provides that if security is ordered uh, and the claimant fails to comply, the proceeding may ultimately be discontinued. So as I've said, Rule 53 largely codifies existing practice, but to my mind, it's a very useful addition to the rules. It provides express authority to tribunals to grant security for costs, provides guidance as to the factors to be considered, and specifies a remedy in cases of noncompliance. Now, in concluding my remarks, I'd just like to highlight an aspect of security for costs that has given rise to difficulty in the cases. And this is the tension that is, I think, inherent in the circumstances that tribunals are to consider uh, as listed in uh, subsection three of rule 53, because those circumstances seek to strike a balance between leaving a successful respondent empty-handed on the one hand and potentially denying the claimant a forum on the other. And these two competing priorities uh, came into sharp relief in the recent, ca recent case, which was called Herzog against Turkmenistan. There, a majority of the tribunal granted security for costs on the ground that the claimant was insolvent and supported by a funder that was not responsible in case there was an adverse costs award. Thereafter, the claimant attempted but failed uh, to arrange the bank guarantee that the tribunal had ordered. Um, but then finding that the claimant had tried in good faith to get the security, a different majority of the tribunal, or apparently a different majority, reversed the early order that had required security. So faced with a direct conflict between leaving the respondent unprotected and denying the claimant a forum, the tribunal favored the latter interest. And this result, I think, highlights the tension that I mentioned. Somewhat ironically, the tribunal ordered security because it was likely that the claimant would be unable to pay a cost award. But when subsequent events made it clear that it was certain that the claimant couldn't pay, the tribunal felt compelled to rescind the order in order to avoid denying uh, the claimant a form altogether. And this is a tension that I think tribunals will struggle with on this issue going forward. 
Uh, and with that, I will hand the floor over to Andres uh, for more. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I just want to make a very brief comment. I, I, I think you, you put at the end of your presentation the problem exactly where it is, which is the tension uh, that exists between letter A and C in this rule. This tension was clear during the discussion of the rule. And someone may say that in an attempt to compromise, the rules creates an impossible test. There is no way to solve the tension between letter A and C. I, I don't have that view. I recognize the difficulty. But uh, from my point of view, this is not different. That the exercise that we lawyer have to do when there is competing legal principles in conflict. What we do is a balancing test, which is obviously common for every everybody in constitutional rights. You know, there is no one that prevails over the other. What happens is that you have to take in the in the circumstances of the case these two competing principles, you know, in account and consider under specific circumstances which one has to prevail in that particular case. It's not an easy task, and this is why I think this is one of the rules where the first decision of the tribunal will be particularly important on trying to set meaningful distinctions to, you know, try to solve this tension. Thank you. May the last word on this. I thought I'd just use um, the last minute on this to remind everyone about the relationship between third party funding and security for costs. The perception or assumption that a funded party is likely to be financially unable to comply with an adverse cost award in the event of an unfavorable outcome in the arbitration. I use the words perception or assumption because this is not always the case or necessarily even usually the case. As Toby mentioned, third party funding is now increasingly becoming a cash flow management tool and it is often used by financially able parties. There is a trend amongst large corporations to seek funding in relation to a portfolio of their legal claims. And the purpose is to improve cash flow, to diversify risks, especially you know, in litigation when one is dealing with business that is not part of the, their core competency. And so to bring in a funder in those circumstances who may have more expertise or experience when it comes to litigation and arbitration and to help instruct the lawyers it, it, it is a very um, rational and reasonable thing to do. You don't have to be impecunious to think that that's a good idea. So therefore, just something for everyone to bear in mind, as Meg and Toby both said earlier, just because there is third party funding in a case does not mean that the respondent is automatically entitled to security for costs. It's relevant, but one still needs to make sure you meet the entire test under the new exit rules. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, Emmanuel, let's turn to you. If you can give us a quick introduction to the new additional facility rules and what's different. Thank you very much, Meg. So we're we are getting to the less well-known, but no less important yellow book. Um, and, and what I propose to do is to say a few words about what the exit additional facility rules are. What are the main changes that were introduced to them in the um, amended rules? And then I'll hand over to Yoshimi to discuss the practical consequences of these amendments in Japan and beyond. Uh, so let's start with a few words about the origins and purpose of the um, exit additional facility rules. And here, I also have some slides to share. I'll try to do that now. I hope you can see the slides. So uh, as, as you all know, the um, exit convention allows arbitral or conciliation proceedings to be conducted between a state party to the exit convention, a contracting state, and an investor of another contracting state. That's what you can see on, on this slide. Now, at the time, in the 70s, 
The number of contracting states was limited. There was about 70 of them at, at the time. And the number of exit cases was also limited at the time. There were just only a couple of them um, in the 70s. So in order to extend the scope of exit and make its services available to an additional number of users, it was decided in 1978 to introduce the additional facility rules to allow investors, and that's what you see here, of non-contracting states to bring claims against contracting states, or conversely, to allow investors from the contracting states to bring claims against a non-contracting states. But at the time, the additional facility rules were not limited to that. They also allowed investors to bring claims under ICSID proceedings that did not directly arise from an investment, while this is a requirement under the ICSID convention. And they also introduced the fact-finding procedure, which was not provided for under the ICSID convention. So you see that since the beginning, the additional facility rules were envisaged as an additional mechanism to the ICSID convention, as opposed to an alternative or a competition to the ICSID convention. And these additional facility rules have been extremely successful. Since that time, and as of 2022, there have been 76 arbitration proceedings conducted under the additional facility rules and two conciliations. So that success is impressive, especially considering that the additional facility rules until today had important limitations. And you can see them on, on the slide. The additional facility rules could not be used in proceedings between a national of a non-contracting state and a non-contracting state. And despite the increasing role of Regional Economic Integration Organization, REIO, on the investment landscape, these REIOs and their non-contracting constituent states could not be part of uh, exit proceedings. So the 2002 revisions fully address those issues. As you can see on, on the slide, the scope of the additional facility rules has been further extended to include disputes between an investor of a non-contracting state and a non-contracting state, and also disputes in cases where a regional economic integration organization or a non-contracting non constituent states of a regional economic in integration organization is a party. And as you can see on the slide, now the full graph is blue, which means that the exit rules are now available to cover all types of um, investment disputes. So this is a very major change. Now, in addition to that, uh, which um, is extending the scope of um, exit to all investment disputes, I wanted to mention three other revisions of the additional facility rules that are less well known, but equally far reaching. The first one is time and cost. The majority of the revisions that were made to the arbitration and conciliation rules under the convention have also been made to the additional facility rules, including in relation to time and cost. And this is important because the alleged cost and length of exit proceedings were one of the major reasons why investors would sometimes choose the unsuitable rules over the exit rules to resolve their investment dispute. So this has been addressed. Point number two, defin definition of investment. This is also a far reaching change in the uh, revised additional facility rules. The additional facility rules now remove all reference to the definition of investment under the exit convention. And this is important because for an investment to be protected under the exit convention, it needs to satisfy two things. Number one, the definition of investment under the treaty. And number two, an objective definition of what an investment should be under the exit convention. That's the so-called double keyhole test. And complying with that test under the ICSID convention makes it more difficult to establish jurisdiction. And that's another reason why some investors favored the unsuitable rules over ICSID in the past, because the unsuitable rules do not have that double standard. So this, again, is addressed in the new additional facility rules. And finally, a third point, which is also a far-reaching revision, definition of investor. The ICSID convention does not allow claims by dual nationals, unlike the unsuitable rules. Well, the new additional facility rules will allow such type of claims. They will leave it entirely to the parties' agreement to decide who should bring claims um, under the rules. So in summary, as you can see, the 2022 revisions of the additional facility rules address most of the criticism that was often made against ICSID, limited scope, 
time and cost and jurisdictional hurdles. And therefore, these revisions make the additional facility rules fully on par. And in some respect, we've seen that more advanced than the unsuitable rules for the uh, resolution of investment dispute. And uh, on that, I will hand over to uh, Yoshimi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel, for comprehensive explanation of um, benefit of new um, exit additional facility rules. Actually, uh, because um, his presentation was so comprehensive, I would add only a limited point um, uh, with respect to opportunities um, for a, con a, a national or contracting um, member state, a contracting state, and also um, limitation, I would say, caveat um, of exit um, additional facility rule. First opportunities, um, as um, Emmanuel elaborated, um, not only the, um, this new rule increased the availability of uh, additional facility rule to those who haven't had access to um, additional facility rules. Uh, but like, you know, Japanese investors, um, a national of contracting, uh, contracting state, they have um, access to additional facility rules, but new additional facility rules become very attractive for those who have access to, but decided not to use and used, you know, unsidero rules instead, because um, as uh, Emmanuel elaborated, these new rules um, address time and cost um, concerns, introduce um, robust uh, prescriptive timeline, um, which includes the timeline for the commencement of the uh, arbitral proceeding, including the constitutional tribunal, as well as the whole um, conduct of arbitration uh, up to the issuance of award and subsequent um, decision by the tribunal. And these robust timeline really make this proceedings attractive um, to even for a national or contracting state, uh, which, ha which had been having access to um, additional facility rule. And one additional point is um, this additional facility rules also have expedited rules. Again, just like you know, exit convention uh, expedited rules, um, it is subject to the agreement of the parties, but still it is encouraging um, to have expedited rules already out there. Um, and, uh, and if the case um, really suit uh, expedited rules, um, party have an option to use um, such expedited rules. Well, I have to conclude my remark uh, with a caveat, unfortunately, um, which is, um, yes, additional facility rule provide um, new features um, and new rules that address time and cost um, that have been complained by the arbitration community and users. But additional facility rules um, is different from exit convention award. So um, two things you have to bear in mind, um, at minimum, first, um, there is a seat of arbitration. Exit convention arbitration um, doesn't have a seat. Um, it immune from the procedural law of the seat because there's no seat. Whereas exit arbitration, uh, additional facility uh, rules, it has seat. And uh, parties have to agree on the, the seat. And if parties cannot agree on the seat, then the tribunal will decide a seat. Second point is enforcement and rec recognition and enforcement of award. Um, what makes exit convention award is attractive. One of the features is Article 54 of exit convention, which provides each contracting state shall recognize an award rendered pursuant to this conventions and binding and enforceable, enforce the pecuniary uh, obligation imposed by that award within its territory as if it were a final judgment of a court in that state. Unfortunately, um, additional facility rules award uh, do not have the benefit of the same, um, same um, system. But um, as I mentioned, um, when parties have an opportunity to choose either UNSUDRO rules or additional facility rules, 
we now see um, a good reason to choose additional facility rules thanks to this robust uh, new rules. Thank you. Thank you. Yoshimi, can you continue on transparency? <laughs> so I want to um, put on the screen. Let's see. Oh, this works. Okay. Yes, um, Meg has nicely um, summarized succinctly the, the robust um, transparency rules under new exit 2022 exit rules. Um, I focus on um, publication of award and decisions, and Toby is going to cover uh, participation of non-party to the arbitration. So I just want to briefly, you know, um, visualize how 2022 exit rules uh, compare to the 2006 exit rules. So talking about awards, you know, because of exit convention, awards can be published subject to consent of the parties, but under the new exit rules, um, there is a deemed consent. So unless parties object within 60 days of the award, the, um, the award will be published. And talking about decisions and orders, um, in fact, decision and orders will be published even if the parties do not agree. The scope of the publication can be discussed between the parties and agree on, but if parties do not agree, then eventually the tribunal decide the scope of the publication of decision and orders. And hearing transcript, um, under 2006 rules, there have been no rules, but under 22, um, hearing transcript can be also published unless the other party objects and upon the request of one party. Why this publication is so important? I would say three points. Um, I would like to point out three points first. Um, it publication is important. Um, transparency is important to maintain the confidence and the integrity of the system. Two, investment arbitration inevitably involves public interest. Public has, um, has a right, is entitled to have access to the decision-making process and decision itself of arbit uh, 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 this investment treaty proceedings. And three, the third one, um, this publication will give a great guidance to parties and also tribunal for the subsequent proceedings both in terms of substance and procedure. In publication of decisions and of order, I hope that will um, extremely streamline the process because those decisions and orders once published will give a clear guidance to the parties and tribunal for the subsequent proceedings. Particularly, I would like to focus on decision on disqualification, um, application for disqualification of arbitrators. ICSID um, is has been very successful in transparency of arbitration proceedings. I just, you know, checked the website of ICSID and I found a website on decisions on disqualification. Um, it lists the case and conclusion, but unfortunately, only some of them are published. The decision itself are published, and most of them are are not published. And if you look at the conclusion, the outcome of this proceedings, most of the applications proposals were declined. Once these you know, decisions are published, that will give you know, guidance to the party in terms of whether it's worth you know, bringing a proposal for disqualification. If it doesn't, such a proposal is not supported by the previous decisions. Perhaps that could follow the consequence, uh, cost consequence, um, in, if the party nonetheless decide to make the proposal for disqualification of arbitrators. So, this is the robust rule of 2022 exit rule on publication. I would like to compare this um, 2022 exit rule uh, with uh, Mauritius Convention. 
So if you compare 2022 exit rules and Mauritius conventions, as you can see, under Mauritius convention award, decision order, list of exhibit, and hearing transcript, all are published by default. And witness statement expert report, parties exhibits, um, exit rule 2022 exit rule do not provide for the publication of those documents, whereas Mauritius Convention, these documents could be available to public. This means that Mauritius Conventions is still um, go ahead of um, 2022 exit rules on publication in theory. But we have to also be aware of the actual, uh, the reality. If you take a look at the, you know, member state of Mauritius Convention, the, only 23 states have signed the Mauritius Convention, and of which nine states have ratified. So due to this extremely low number of state parties who have ratified convention, the reach and impact of convention is unfortunately, at, as of now, limited. Whereas exit uh, 22 rules have direct and immediate impact to the arbitration community. And I really hope to see more decisions should be published, uh, which will serve as guidance to the parties and tribunal to streamline the process. Thank you. Thank you. Toby, a word on non-disputing party and non-disputing treaty party submissions. Yeah, um, I'll be very brief on this. It's a very, very important provision, however. Um, there's a big difference between commercial arbitration and investor state in the sense that whilst commercial arbitration really concerns disputes between the immediate parties only, investor state very often, perhaps increasingly, will impact on a wider range of interests. And so this new Rule 67, 67 is not new, but the additions to 67 and 68 are very important in allowing tribunals to widen the net and to allow participation by interests that are beyond the immediate disputing parties. Uh, some arbitrators are reluctant to allow that because of a commercial arbitration mindset, but the rule as it is now enforces the powers of tribunals uh, to, to do this. And they have in them a balancing, which is to allow third parties to come in with some access to the documentation and an ability effectively to participate but on the other hand, there is a control that that participation doesn't cause an undue burden to the existing parties or imbalance the, the process. I think the time is very short, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, it's tremendous. Um, showing great time efficiency, we're rounding into our last topic, which is mediation. And May, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the benefits and the useful features of the new mediation rules. Thanks, Meg. Um, there's just so much to say about mediations, but I will keep to what I feel are the key benefits. So uh, to kick off with some general comments, it's often the case that a party receiving a mediation request from an opposing party will, at least at the outset, express some reluctance to engage in mediation. So it is important for parties to be aware of the many benefits of mediating under the new exit mediation rules. Um, just briefly, they are the first um, institutional mediation rules specifically designed for investor state disputes. Um, they complement the exit's existing regimes for arbitration, conciliation and fact finding, so can be used side by side. Um, these multiple regimes for the same dispute or one after the other on the same disputes. And in terms of the advantages, um, again, there are many, but the ones that really uh, resonate with me are um, mostly related to the flexibility of outcome. And it allows parties to preserve and possibly even expand their relationship. Um, structure a self-determined outcome, a termination of their relationship, if that is what they want, but according to their respective needs and priorities, rather than what is required under the contractual provisions or under the BIT. Um, monetary as well as non-monetary settlement options are available. 
And importantly, these options are not available from the arbitral tribunal or from the arbitral process. So taking control of the outcome um, by the parties through the use of mediation and not leaving the outcome to the tribunal is a really attractive proposition. Um, it can be based on legal as well as non-legal considerations, and it can be based on shared interests. Um, the other thing, and, and it ties into what um, Toby said earlier about um, non-party participants, is that it does have the flexibility, the new rules, to allow for participation of stakeholders who are impacted by the investment or by the dispute, but are not technically parties to the contract or to the arbitration. Um, stakeholders such as local communities or non-government organizations or different factions of a government oftentimes have different interests that need to be represented and a mediation might be a good forum to consult with each of these groups. And finally, the, a big advantage of mediation is that awards are oftentimes, as you, we all know, imposed not arrive through mutual consent and one or more parties will be very upset about it. And so the winning party runs the risk um, that the losing party will breach and uh, will breach the award or will seek to, in the case of exit, annul the awards. With a mediated settlement, there are far, far fewer enforcement issues. That's not to say that it never arises, but you know, it, it certainly makes um, honoring the uh, settlement um, and enforcement much more straightforward and potentially taking a year or two off the process and then a year or two of legal costs or, or more as well um, in savings, depending on when you mediate and, and, and whether it's successful. And just that deep, that deeper dive into the new mediation rules. There are quite a few um, new um, procedures that have been introduced, but I, I want to focus on two broad topics today. First is the access to mediation. Uh, like the additional facility rules that Emmanuel spoke about, these have been really sort of fleshed out to, to, to bring in more parties and more disputes uh, uh, into exit mediation. There are two prerequisites for use of exit mediation rules. The first is that the dispute must relate to an investment involving a state or an REIO, such as ASEAN, uh, which is you know, well known to, in this region. And the second rule is that the parties must consent in writing to engaging in mediation under the rules. Um, this is, you know, helpfully very straightforward, more straightforward than in arbitration because you are not having to deal with nationality requirements for parties. Um, and therefore exit mediations can also involve investors and nationals of the state party itself. That is the respondent state in the dispute. There is no requirement for either party to be linked to exit convention member states. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's open to all. Um, and thus there is very, very broad access to mediation with states, much broader than uh, you know, in exit arbitration. The second major advantage that I wanted to focus on with, with the new rules is confidentiality and the without prejudice nature of mediation under the new exit rules. Rule 10 expressly provides for the confidentiality of the mediation, including in respect of documents generated, uh, documents obtained through the mediation process, but even extends so far as the facts that the parties have engaged in mediation is also confidential unless the parties agree otherwise, because I know that uh, senior government officials who may have a mandate to settle are oftentimes very, very nervous about the political uh, impact and implication of even engaging in mediation, let alone settlement. And it's very difficult um, to get past that concern. Um, so, you know, the fact that the rules sort of bake in a very strong confidentiality um, culture is very important. Um, but of course, the parties can deviate from that if they are, if they agree to do so um, and, and, and waive the confidentiality requirement. 
there are exceptions to confidentiality waiver by the parties is one of them but also if the information is already independently available outside of the mediation that would not you know make make it confidential because it's already in the public um, or if disclosure is required by law so these are the usual exceptions to confidentiality Relatedly, uh, Rule 11 prohibits the parties from relying on any position, admission, views expressed, information exchanged during the mediation in other proceedings. So if there is a parallel exit arbitration happening or even a, another legal proceeding, unless the parties otherwise agree that the positions that are exchanged in the mediation are without prejudice to, to, to or the, any other formal legal proceeding that might be taking place. So this will promote a, a, a fuller, more frank exchange and more constructive discussion between the parties during the course of the mediation. Now, I'm sure um, everyone will also be kind of thinking about, because we just heard about the, 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 the emphasis on transparency, that perhaps all of this emphasis, emphasis on confidentiality arguably clashes with the uh, concern about making sure that there is increased transparency between um, part, uh, in these investor state disputes. And with this in mind, the new mediation rules also contain certain mechanisms designed to promote public awareness and transparency if this is what the parties think is necessary. So, for example, a, a joint communication plan can be initiated as part of the mediation management conference and um, refined and, and, and elaborated on throughout the mediation, setting out the timing and the process for making information available to the broader interest groups and the, and the public, if this is in the interest of, of, of that particular mediation and that particular dispute. Parties can also agree on involving non-disputing parties um, in the investor state mediation process to promote transparency as well. So there are other features, new features in the in a much more detailed mediation rules that are included in the latest rules. I, um, I won't have time to get into all of them, but I feel that these two broad advantages and, and, and new rules really help to um, elevate the attractiveness of mediation, which is already, as I said, upfront has a lot of advantages compared to more adversarial arbitration anyway. Finally, you know, everyone uh, knows clients are driven by um, resources, and time and cost aspects, considerations. Investment mediation is obviously much faster and much more cost effective than arbitration. We've heard some statistics earlier about the typical exit arbitration running for, you know, upwards of three and a half years and the average costs are upwards of five million US dollars. Um, for claimants and, and, and just under that for respondents. By contrast, investor state mediation is typically a fraction of that and much more expedient way of resolving the dispute. So in conclusion, parties should mediate early and they should mediate often. Thanks, Meg. Thank you, May, that's great. Brian, you have the last word here and uh, we'll be able to close on time. Okay, well, that's intimidating, but thank you. Um, uh, let me start by thanking May for the wonderful, comprehensive presentation. I'd like to start um, by uh, making a short note about history. Um, people will recall that the ICSIC Convention provides not only for arbitrations, but also for conciliation proceedings. And indeed, the drafters of the convention thought that conciliation and not arbitration would be the most used procedure. In fact, of course, the opposite occurred in practice, and the vast majority of exits cases have been arbitration proceedings. As of June 2022, only about 1.5% of the cases registered by ICSID were conciliation proceedings. And so for me, it raises the question whether the new mediation rules will uh, fare better than the conciliation rules have. And in my view, they very likely will. Because the first thing I'd point out is a lot of investment arbitrations settle. ICSID statistics reveal that from the outset of the convention through June of this year, 36% of ICSID arbitrations settled or were discontinued without a final ruling by the tribunal. And of that figure, there was a formal settlement agreement in 9% of all cases, 
And then a further 18%, the proceeding was discontinued at the request of both parties, which is indicative of some sort of settlement. So we can probably estimate that settlements have occurred in perhaps 25% of exit arbitrations. That substantial figure suggests, at least to me, that there is appetite among investors and states for settling their disputes. And that in turn suggests that there will be appetite for mediations, which are of course essentially assisted settlement negotiations. Mediation will be attractive, I think, for all of the reasons that May has explained so well. Now, it's traditionally been thought that it's difficult for states to settle investment arbitration claims against them. Senior officials may not wish to take responsibility for paying out money to an allegedly aggrieved investor. And indeed, in some systems, they may face civil liability if they're later found to have done so unwisely. So there may be a temptation to fight it out. And then if the state loses, just blame the lawyers. But there are, I think, meaningful indications that this is changing. Anecdotal evidence suggests that respondent states are increasingly hiring sophisticated lawyers and advisors to assist them in investment cases, and such advisors are well-placed to explain to their state clients that settlement can be just as wise in an investment arbitration as it is in a commercial arbitration, where we know that something, at least ICC cases, about 60% settle at some point during the proceeding. There's also more objective evidence that in interest in mediation is increasing for investment disputes, either as an alternative to arbitration or alongside it being conducted. Just to name a few examples, uh, in 2016, the Energy Charter Treaty Organization published its Guide on Investment Mediation, which aims to assist states in understanding the mediation process and how it can be used to settle disputes. And as of 2020, about one third of ICSID's member states had adopted that guide. Some newer generation investment treaties have formally incorporated mediation as a dispute settlement mechanism. These include the EU-Singapore Investment Protection Agreement, the EU-Canada Trade Agreement, the CETA, and the Netherlands model bit of 2018. And most recently, of course, on 12 September 2020, the Singapore Convention, which aims to make mediated settlement agreements as enforceable worldwide as arbitration awards, entered into force. 55 countries are signatories, although to date only 10 have ratified it. And finally, the current political environment, I think, is likely to enhance interest in the mediation of investor state disputes. As we all know, investment arbitration has recently been subject to a lot of criticism. This has been particularly pronounced when uh, disputes are perceived as interfering with state uh, ability, the state's ability to adopt policies aimed at addressing environmental and climate change concerns. Consider, for example, the recent cases brought by RWE uh, and Uniper against the Netherlands uh, concerning coal generation of electricity. And of course, the European Union apparently wants out of investment arbitration altogether in favor of investment courts on which the states troublingly will appoint all the judges. And all of this suggests to me that both states and investors may have more reason to favor mediation than they have in the past. As such, the new exit mediation rules are a welcome and timely addition, in my view, to the dispute settlement toolbox. With that, I will stop. Thank you. Tremendous. Thank you very much. That was a, a tour de force by everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, Fumihiko, I leave it uh, to you to close the proceedings. Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, distinguished participant. I'm Yanaka Fumihiko, Director of Litigation Bureau of Ministry of Justice of Japan. First of all, first of all, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the participants and the speakers and panelists and the moderators for their contribution and the participation yesterday and today. In particular, I'd like to convey my special thanks to Meg and Anna uh, for uh, co-hosting uh, the 2022 Tokyo Forum on Dispute Resolution. The main theme of the forum was anchoring the new approaches to the core principles and due process and fairness. Uh, regarding the answer session on the stock taking of development in dispute resolution in the digital economy, panels discussed the use of technology in arbitration, online mediation, and dispute resolution on online platform. These topics are essential to resolve the dispute effectively and efficiently in digital economy. Um, since my colleague, uh, Director Matsumoto, has already elaborated on discussion yesterday, I'd like to echo his remarks today. 
With respect to the um, X session today, the main theme was 2022 X rules. I'd like to congratulate Exit on tremendous success of amendment present. This session provided a timely opportunity to discuss the major changes related to the new rules. The new um, Exit rules will make case more efficient for parties, enhance the transparency of the procedures, and broaden the access to the Exit facilities and the services. I'm convinced that new rules will form a strong basis for overcoming challenges in the new era. I hope this forum has been a valuable opportunity to take stock of development in dispute resolution in digital economy and to deepen the discussion on the new exit rules. Furthermore, I'd like to assure you all that the Ministry of Justice of Japan is determined to continue its strong support for Anstor and Exit. In conclusion, once again, I'd like to express my um, sincere gratitude to all participants and to everyone involved in planning and holding this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fumi. And on behalf of the co-organizer, I send my heartfelt thanks to Meg, Anna, and all distinguished panelists, speakers, and contributors to this forum. And thanks to all the attendees for their participation. We here successfully conquered the 2022 Tokyo Forum on Dispute Resolution. Thank you once again, and wishing you all happy, happy holiday season. Thank you.